Manchester. I'm just going to make some opening remarks, but before I do, um, I'm absolutely delighted that Nancy Rothwell, our vice president, our president and vice chancellor, um, has joined us. We were expecting only to see her virtually, but she's here in person, so I thought it's a great opportunity for her to come and say a few words. So thank you, Nancy. So thanks, Fiona. Uh, and apologies, I'm a late, unscheduled gate crasher, um, but I did want to come along and just say it's absolutely fantastic that um, the Productivity Institute is in Manchester. This morning, I spent all morning hosting a visit from John King, Sir John Kingman, and those of you who don't know him, he was until very recently the chair of UKRI, which of course has funded the Productivity Institute. He's still chair of LNG, which is our partner in Innovation District Manchester. But he commented how delighted he was that the Productivity Institute was here in Manchester and he wanted to hear about it. And I suggested he comes back to learn more about it because we gave him a packed day in uh, all around graphing and materials and everything. But he said he'd like to come back. So I'm absolutely delighted and I'm delighted I can be here in person. So nice to be at events. The second events in this lecture theatre in a couple yeah. of weeks yeah. because I was here for Tony Danker. So I'll let people, I won't hold things up any further. Get on with it and good luck to the Productivity Institute. Thank you. <laughs> Right, thank you, thank you, Nancy. So I'm delighted to see so many of you here joining us today to hear from a colleague, Professor of Productivity, Bart Van Ark, in this Original Thinking Lecture. Now, this Original Thinking series is an opportunity for us here in the Business School to welcome new colleagues and to celebrate their successes. During the pandemic, this series has provided us with an opportunity to connect with colleagues virtually. This is the first in the series to move to a hybrid format. So I'm really pleased to be welcoming so many of you here today and an in-house audience, as well as an online audience this afternoon. So Professor Bart Van Ark joined us here at Alliance Manchester Business School last summer as Professor of Productivity Studies. He is also Managing Director and Principal Investigator of the £32 million ESRC funded Productivity Institute. It was launched in August 2020 and is, as Nancy was just mentioning, the largest single investment into social science research by the ESRC and UKRI. Now, headquartered here in Manchester, the Institute brings together nine UK-wide institutions to lay the foundations for an era of sustained and inclusive productivity growth by bringing together academic research, policy studies and business engagement. Bart is an internationally acclaimed economist in the field of international comparative productivity, measurement and analysis, innovation and technology and digital transformation. His research has cut across the areas of economic growth, development economics, economic history, and international economics and business. From 2008 to 2020, Bart was chief economist and head of the Economy Strategy and Finance Center at the Conference Board, a global business research think tank headquartered in New York. Here, he oversaw the production of widely watched economic indicators and growth forecasts around the globe. And Bart is still a senior advisor to the conference board. Bart has published extensively on the topic of productivity in leading national and international journals. He has been widely featured in major international business media commenting on productivity. So today, Bart is going to take us on a tour through global productivity land. He will assess what he has learned about the drivers of and barriers to productivity and what he thinks we still need to discover. He will place today's productivity puzzles in the Western world in a long-term and international comparative perspective, presenting evidence and narratives for the three countries in which he has worked. Uh, so in particular, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom and the United States. But beyond that, the productivity experiences of the European Union and Asia will also feature in his talk. So he will address the role of technology, innovation, skills, policies and institutions on productivity patterns and trends, 
but we'll also look at the key challenges for the productivity agenda of the future, namely considerations around climate change and the distributional effects of productivity as well. Now, there's going to be plenty of time towards the end of today's session for your questions. If you're in the room, please raise your hand and we will pass the microphone to you. If you're watching online, please type them in the chat area as we go through the event. The discussion and questions will be facilitated by my colleague, Professor of Accounting and member of the Productivity Institute, Ken McPhail. And now I'm sure, like me, you're anxious to get started. Uh, and I'm delighted now to hand over to Professor Bart Van Eyck. Thank you, Bart. Thank you. Well, thank you, Fiona, and thank you, Nancy. You're very honored you're, you're both here and for your kind introductory words. And also to uh, many of our Manchester colleagues here today, uh, many of you uh, I met virtually, uh, but more and more people I'm beginning to meet in some kind of three-dimensional way, which is really good. And it's nice to see the place coming back to life and know that the building is not just the Productivity Institute, but many others as well. Uh, I also welcome my colleagues again uh, of the other uh, 10 uh, organizations participating in the Productivity Institute. I'm, I'm really happy again to see many of you here. As I uh, reminded this uh, afternoon, last time we met in person was uh, 19 months ago in the penthouse upstairs here to actually put our final hand to the proposal. This and ultimately led to the Productivity Institute that we have here. So it's great to actually be here back here after 19 months and we've done a lot of work in between. Uh, as Fiona said, many uh, uh, people are attending us today virtually, friends and colleagues uh, and family from the Netherlands, of course, from the UK and the US. Uh, I would have loved to have you here, but, uh, but I know you're there and I much appreciate that. The um, Productivity Institute is, if I can get this moving, uh, which is kind of an interesting one. Yep, there we go. Uh, the Productivity Institute is now one year on its way. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, many who helped us to get going. Uh, we have about 40 or so researchers, 130 members in our eight regional productivity forums, a governing council, the steering and input com committee. And in particular, of course, my thanks extend to the executive team and the executive committee who have been very patient with me. Uh, you know, here's this guy with a Dutch accent, uh, you know, sticking his nose into UK uh, productivity matters and all sorts of other issues. And I hope I will not disappoint you today. We're also really blessed with the support of an excellent um, uh, solid uh, uh, program services team, Christina, Michael, Michelle, Lizzie, great uh, to have you here. And it's a, I'm really looking forward to working with you in the future. And last but not least, I wanna extend my thanks to uh, Nicola Pikey, our engagement and operations director, and Tony Venables, our research director, with whom I've worked so much together in the last year and so much looking forward to continue to do that over the next four years. So uh, that's really uh, something that, uh, that's important. Now, uh, you see right on the top, the UKRI, which uh, Nancy already mentioned, and the ESRC. Uh, I know that some of our colleagues from the ESRC who has given us this five-year grant are joining us today. Uh, we always thank them, but this is special this time because for the ESRC, this is also something special. It's a five-year grant, which really gives us a very long runway uh, to deal with this issue. Productivity is a long-term issue, as you will hear me talk about today, and we really benefit from that long runway that you have given us. And again, I'm looking forward to continue to work with you. Which brings me to um, the topic of today's lecture, traveling through productivity land. Indeed, travel is very much about three things. It's about time, it's about motion, and it's about place. And that, in fact, pretty much summarizes what productivity is about. It takes time for productivity's true and sustained effects to show up. It sometimes literally requires you to move resources to the places where they can be used most productively. And it is critical to put productivity in the context of the place where it happens to capture the benefits for the regional and the local communities. Now, my own travels through productivity land that Fiona already referred to a little have been very interesting, but I hope this is not my valedictory lecture. So I'm not going to give you everything of what I've done uh, over the years. Instead, I will focus on just a few, a few snapshots that from travels that I've done in a couple of countries and that I think are relevant for the journey with the Productivity Institute in the next few years. That obviously includes the Netherlands where I grew up and spent 
most of the first half of my career. It of course includes the UK, where in fact I spent two times time. The first time was in the late 80s at the National Institute of Economics and Social Research, one of our partners in the Institute, and now here at AMBS in Manchester. And of course the United States, where I spent the last 13 years uh, with the conference board. There's a fourth country there. Yes, I will sneak in a little bit of Germany. I'd never worked there, but I will give in a little bit to what I think is a bit of an obsession in this country to always compare ourselves with Germany. So I'm gonna do a little bit of that in this uh, discussion as well. But let me start my discussion uh, and my journey on productivity from a village in the east of the Netherlands, where I was born, where I grew up and where my father was the managing director of a company making crisp bakes. This was a family business started by my grandfather and two of his brothers back in the 1920s. And in the 1950s, my father took over together with his cousin as the next generation. And over the years, the firm grew into a medium-sized business, accounting for a good deal of the jobs in the village and surroundings. Now, until the 1970s, virtually every Dutchman ate a crisp bake for breakfast. I still do now and then in the weekend, you can buy them at Tesco, as you can see, there's a little ad here. But to admit with the rising popularity of modern American lifestyles, breakfast habits also changed. You know, you don't want to spend the morning wasting your time chewing on a crumbling bis uh, crisp bake. So many of the Dutch also switched to taking a bowl of cereals with milk on the fly. The globalization of consumer taste, of which this is an example, trade and investment, it all led to a major restructuring of the crisp bake uh, industry. In one decade, during the 1970s, the number of crisp bake factories in the Netherlands fell from 17 to only four, and the total number of workers in that industry decimated. The ones that kept standing massively invested in automation, especially in the labor intensive dough making process and in packaging, low prices and brand loyalty became the major competitive weapons. And it was especially so as the, uh, the grocery sector, the retail sector, underwent its own restructuring with fewer but ever more powerful supermarket chains, negotiating razor thin margins and selling their own labels, making it even harder for the small suppliers to survive. Now, fortunately, fortunately the crisp bake factory in my village is still there. While ownerships changed hands, and I ended up to become an economist rather than a crisp baker, the new owners knew the business, in contrast to a lot of other firms that were either absorbed by large food conglomerates or even by private equity firms. So today the plant produces a multitude in terms of output compared to five decades ago with probably half the number of employees, but many of them significantly better skilled. It made massive leaps in productivity, especially because of the introduction of computer numerically controlled machinery, which essentially was the predecessor of the more sophisticated digital machinery or even robotics today. The fact that the village, which used to be home to, two, to just two uh, medium-sized employers, the Crisp Bake Factory and another family business making soap products, the fact that it still has both plants has been a key factor in rescuing that place from going under, something we have witnessed in many other places in the Netherlands, in the UK and elsewhere. True, most people in the village probably now work elsewhere, but the presence of a few highly productive firms help the community to retain some of its basic human organizational and knowledge capital. The village is pretty well tied in with larger nearby towns and it serves smaller communities around it with vibrant schools, healthcare facilities, etc. Now I'm giving you this example because I think it really illustrates so well that productivity connects with many other economic and social phenomena in a spatial context. How it can keep a place alive or even revitalize it rather than destroy it. So I think this is a good example, but I think um, I've always found that studies looking into one specific firm or a group of firms or specific defined industry can be very helpful for studying productivity. For example, in, an early 19, in the early 1990s, I did some work with the McKinsey Global Institute with on one of their first studies on productivity in manufacturing. And this was a study focusing on a bunch of sectors, including automotive, steel, consumer electronics, and food processing in Germany, Japan, and the United States. And one specific case I remember very well was the case of productivity in the beer industry in the three countries. Now, I learned a lot about technology of brewing and different business models, but the specifics of the social context, custom, culture, and taste were crucial to the productivity performance of plants producing beer. 
one specifically contentious issue was the apparent trade off in Germany between small, low productivity plants producing, producing high quality beer. And this, of course, became an even more interesting topic when we got all these microbreweries also here in the UK and in the United States. Now, I have to admit that the beer industry case was also the one that got you as a presenter always in trouble. So I'm not going to go into a lot more detail here. Later on in the 1990s, I worked with Bob McCuggin at the conference board on productivity studies in the retail industry. This was at the time that we saw the first wave of information and communication technology impacting on store and inventory management. It gave the US retail sector a head start on both scale and scope, causing the rapid expansion of big, big box stores. Most European countries saw those changes happen much more slowly, but the UK actually paced ahead of various countries on the continent because it in fact rapidly removed a lot of regulatory obstacles, even though some of those regulations had been there to protect, for example, worker hours or to save a village from losing another neighborhood shop. As a last example of industry example of industry studies, much more recently, last year, Diane Coyle, who leads the Productivity Institute Knowledge Capital Theme, conducted a very interesting study on the productivity performance of the National Health Service during the pandemic. It combines a critique of the official measures of healthcare output and productivity with an in-depth study, case study, of what actually happened on the ground during the first phase of the pandemic. When measured productivity apparently declined, while at the same time, the sector made drastic improvements in terms of technology and in terms of organization that might have taken years to, uh, to happen without a crisis. So this work on specific firms, on specific sectors, makes clear how idiosyncratic the drivers of productivity can be. We need a range of different lenses, including, including economics, but so management, innovation, political and behavioral science, to help us understand what is context specific and what, for example, uh, uh, can be generalized much better in order to inform policy making at a central or a local level. And it's good to know that our eight regional productivity forums in the Institute have already shown to be critical to understand these different contextualizations underlying the drivers of productivity. Now, before pro proceeding with my travels, let me pause for a minute on the questions about productivity we should be asking ourselves. I think there are four. What is productivity? Why is it important? Why has it slowed down? And what can be done about it? Now, the first two questions I, in fact, somewhat implicitly answered in the Chris Bake factory example, but I think it might be helpful to be a little bit more specific. Productivity is about some measure of output relative to some measure of input. The output and the input measures can be really simple, such as the number of crisp bakes you produce compared to the number of workers you put in in order to get these crisp bakes out of the factory. But it quickly gets a lot more complicated when we talk about multiple outputs and multiple inputs in a factory or multiple factories in the same industry. And it gets even harder when new products and new services come along. This became most apparent with the appearance of digital products and services in the last two decades. Many of you are familiar with Nobel Prize winner Bob Soros' quip in 1987, when he said, you can see the computer age everywhere, except in the productivity statistics. For the subsequent decade, that simple but very powerful quote determined a good deal of my research program, as well as that of many others. It turned out that the computers were in the statistics, but we were just not very good at that time to uh, separate out the changes in the quantity, quality, and uh, prices of those computers. In today's new digital economy, the measurement issues are probably even bigger. When it comes to the productivity from digital apps, we don't perhaps even know what a monetary value actually is, as many of the observed benefits from these apps apparently come for free. Many of the inputs needed in the digital economy are of an intangible nature. Tangible inputs, like machines and materials, you can touch and feel, and you can measure them. Intangible inputs, such as software and research and development, are less visible to the eye, but ever more powerful as a source of productivity growth. Software and R&D are now a regular part of our productivity statistics, but that's not true for things like innovation competencies or management skills. Incidentally, my first inaugural lecture, which is 20 years ago in Groningen, was on the topic of intangibles or missing capitals for productivity research. 
Much progress has been made since, but Eric Brin Jolson, now at Stanford, recently argued that missing the production of those intangibles is one possible reason for measured productivity growth to be slow. When venturing away from market-based to non-market activities like healthcare or education, the question becomes even more existential, namely what the output measure actually is. For example, in the case of healthcare, we obviously shouldn't be counting as an output the number of beds occupied in a hospital. Instead, we should focus on the outcome, which is the speed by which we get patients out of these beds and back on their feet. Or perhaps even more broadly, we want to measure how healthcare improves people's ability to live a better or more productive life. In this case, our gross domestic product wouldn't be a very good output measure, and instead we should go for something like welfare or well-being. It's encouraging to see that a large number of academics and statisticians also in the Institute are doing important work on, on, on developing new output, outcome measures. But as a productivity researcher, I want to remind ourselves that we also need to measure the resources that are needed to obtain those outcomes. For example, good healthcare requires good healthcare inputs, including prevention, including better diets, including physical sex, uh, exercise. Or lowering CO2 emissions requires us to measure, uh, to include measures of natural capital, which are currently either absent or inadequately measured in the statistics. Our research program on productivity is therefore key to the well-being agenda. And later this year, we will be doing a workshop on this topic for a special issue of the International Productivity Monitor. To answer our third and fourth question, why has productivity slowed down and what can we do about it? I need to pick up my travels again. In the mid 1980s, I started my PhD research in Groningen with Angus Madison, who has been my mentor for 15 years. Angus' main research question was why some countries are rich and others are poor. And productivity was a pretty important part of that. He used a strongly empirical and international comparative approach, which then brought me on the path of the National Institute of Social and Economic Research in London in the late 1980s. National Institute has a long tradition on productivity research. The real productivity diehards in the audience will remember Laszlo Rosta's detailed comparison of manufacturing productivity between the UK and the US in the, for the 1930s, which he published in the late 1940s. That work uh, caused quite a stir because it was one of the first accounts of the large superiority in productivity the US had gained over the UK in just a few decades. Recent work by former colleagues from Groningen, Herman de Jong and Job Walter, uh, using new techniques and data largely confirmed Rosta's findings, but in extending the data to the post-war period, they found the gap to be even larger and growing over time. Rosta's work was one of the first reminders that slavishly copying productivity models from other countries, for example, from the US, which was a very popular thing during this time in the UK, wasn't necessarily going to solve the productivity shortfall. Since, 19, since the 1970s, Sig Price had overseen a large portfolio of work at the National Institute on Human Capital, Skills, and Productivity. And while he was also interested with the US, by that time, he had begun to wonder why UK productivity was also falling behind it of continental Europe, in particular Germany, the little British obsession I mentioned a little earlier. So when I joined uh, the Sig team as a junior researcher in 1988, he ordered a comparison of productivity in the UK with the Netherlands. Now, it turned out, as a matter of fact, that I was stepping in quite a long tradition here. Indeed, one of the first international productivity comparisons ever done was between the Netherlands and the United Kingdom by Samuel Pappas, who wrote the following in his diary on 13 February 1665, when he visited a brave roomy vessel called Experiment, owned by Sir William Petty. And he wrote, so went on shore to a Dutch house to drink some mum, and there light up some Dutchmen with whom we had a good discourse touching stovering and the making of cables. But to see how despicably they speak of us for using so many hands more to do anything than they do, they closing a gable with 20 that we use 60 men upon. That's a pretty stark productivity advantage of about 300%. It may have been specific to the state of commercial shipping in the Netherlands at that time. In any case, 320 years later, I published a somewhat less spectacular productivity advantage of the Netherlands over the UK, but, but 40 to 60% above the UK manufacturing productivity level was still pretty large. 
Indeed, Britain had gradually lost its productivity advantage over a large number of Northwest European countries, as well as the United States. During the 1990s and 1980s and 1990s, the productivity gap narrowed, but uh, there was, is now a broad consensus that this productivity revival was more due to greater competitive pressures wiping out large parts of the manufacturing sector rather than the result of a resurgent in innovation and productivity growth. Since the mid-1990s, manufacturing productivity growth in the UK began to weaken again, and the gap with other countries widened, especially after the financial crisis. It also appears that the manufacturing sector in the UK has shrunk more than in other countries, especially Germany, and that its remaining strength had narrowed to fewer sectors, in particular pharma uh, pharmaceutical, aerospace, and automotive. When broadening the lens outside manufacturing, it is clear that the UK productivity growth had no, has known its ups and downs, and its dynamics differ across sectors. For example, the relatively large financial industry showed a spectacular productivity improvement during the 1990s and early part of this century, but then it lost ground again since the financial crisis. But most importantly, many firms in the services sector, especially the foundational economy, have seen a significant weakening in productivity growth. While it is surely interesting and intriguing to look at comparative levels of productivity, and they're always good fodder for powerful statements like, at what day in the week can we stop working and go for the weekend if we had productivity similar to that of Germany or the US or the Netherlands? Such kind of comparisons don't really tell the whole story. When the low productivity level in the UK is, uh, while the low productivity level in the UK is due to country specific factors keeping the UK levels, at its own steady state, the slowing productivity growth across all economies, especially in the past decade, should make us concerned about the frontier as well. Indeed, the slowdown was pretty uniform across countries. It's just that Britain slowed more, possibly just because it converged back to its own steady state level. There has been and still is a lot of debate about the precise productivity, uh, the precise measures for productivity growth, and soon we'll see more changes. For example, the introduction of double deflating techniques of output and input by the Office of National Statistics next month is likely to soften the UK slowdown somewhat. Also, recent work by the OECD suggests that self-reported working hours in the UK Labour Force Survey overstate actual labour input more than in other countries, which would have caused an understatement of the UK productivity level and an overstatement of the gap. Getting the numbers right is really important for making the right diagnosis and for adopting policies that are getting us to the solution. But three key observations on the slowdown of UK productivity are unlikely to be trashed by any revision in the numbers. First, the systemic underinvestment in key components of intangible capital, including human knowledge and organizational or firm capital. Second, the tendency of many UK firms and sectors to absorb large amounts of relatively low skill and low productive jobs, setting the UK economy off on a job rich but productivity poor growth path over the past 10 to 15 years. And third, both previous observations have caused long tails of low productivity firms in virtually every sector of the economy. I will now focus on three key sources of productivity growth to find out what positive level effects or even permanent growth effects on productivity we might see in the coming decade from specific treatments by policy and business. Digital transformation, skill formation, and institutional reform. Returning to my journey, in the early 2000s, I began to work with the Conference Board, which is a global business think tank. There was a strong interest in productivity as many companies had invested massively in digital technologies. There was a strong optimism about how the latest vintages of new digital technologies would create a productivity boom. So business leaders were really puzzled about why we continue to see slow productivity growth at the aggregate level. This is not a new question. In fact, there is substantive evidence from historians that new so-called general purpose technologies or more broadly technological or industrial revolutions always take significant time, often decades, to diffuse across the economy. This has been true for steam and railways during the 19th century, for steel, electricity, and heavy engineering around the turn of the century, and for oil, automobiles, and mass production during the mid 20th century. And the reasons for this time lag between invention and diffusion are multifold. In a newly published working paper by the Productivity Institute, Martin Fleming, former chief economist of IBM, 
undertakes an intriguing effort to identify the key triggers that have caused a regime change in those industrial revolutions and discusses the implications for the digital age, which is by some dubbed as the fourth industrial revolution. Building on the evolutionary school, especially Carlotta Pires, Martin makes a distinction between an installation period during which the new technology competes for attention with the old technology and the deployment period when the new technology takes the lead. And he then teases out three key factors that are critical to those regime switches. For the non-academics among you, the next minute or two may become a bit tedious and technical, so take a breather and bear with me. First, as new technologies come along, not everyone is jumping at them at once. At the same time as front runners make investments in a new technology, investments in old technology slow down, and as a result, the average age of the capital stock goes up. The new technology can even temporarily reduce investment, demand, and substitute capital for labor. Usually, a, a shock like a financial crisis can then trigger the definitive transition to the new technology, especially as demand starts to increase after a crisis and the age of the capital stock begins to fall. Second, the arrival of a new general purpose technology might cause a decline in the labor income share. Greater rewards go to techn technological front runners who potentially gain more market power and take a larger cut of the pie in terms of capital income or rents. In contrast, technology laggards can only survive by saving on labor costs or otherwise go out of business. Now, to link technology to the decline in labor income shares is up for debate because there are, of course, many other factors causing a decline in labor income shares. But I think that the rise of so-called superstar firms like Google's and Amazon's, but also large firms outside the digital sector, has contributed to declining labor income shares during the latest installation period. Third, a key a uh, trigger point for transitioning from the installation to the deployment, uh, deployment phase is the strengthening of absorptive capacity of lagging firms, which causes knowledge to diffuse and see more companies and industries pick up on productivity. Skills and institutional reforms, which I will talk about next, play a large role in this. In this respect, a great analogy arises from the work of Arnold Harburger, who once described the impact of a new technology as going from a mushroom pattern to a yeast pattern. First, the productivity effects of the technology pop up seemingly randomly across firms and industries or places and outperform the rest. But gradually, the uh, diffusion transforms to a yeast pattern where the technology is implemented more uniformly across the board, causing a more broad based contribution to productivity growth. In a series of papers with Klaas de Vries and Abdul Aaron Bam, which we started at the conference board, we tested this idea. And we indeed found that industries that had invested more in digital technology tended to show faster productivity growth compared to industries that were less digital intensive. This was also visible during the period after the financial crisis, and it was even visible during the pandemic in 2020, which is as we showed in our latest paper. Taken together, I think there is good reason to believe we may have entered the deployment phase of the fourth industrial revolution, but the effects are still trickling through slowly. One possible reason for this are the near zero interest rates, which hinders the reallocation of capital to the most productive economic activities. So once inflation takes hold at a higher level and interest rates rise, I would expect that digital transformation is going to become more pivotal in accelerating productivity growth. In discussing skill formation, I'll take a step back on my journey to when I started at the National Institute in 1988. Sig Price was a pioneer studying the importance of education and skills for productivity. The work was very detailed oriented and focused on many aspects of education, including the quality of mass training and general schooling, but especially the importance of vocational education and apprenticeships. In a series of detailed comparisons of manufacturing plants, which I mainly did with Jeff Mason, I made a trip down memory lane in the early 1990s by looking at training and apprenticeships in the biscuit industry in the UK, the Netherlands, and Germany. Biscuits was the other product line in my dad's factory, apart from crisp bakes. We showed that the, production, that the provision of vocational education at age 14 to 16 and subsequent education tracks for 16 plus generated workforce skills in continental European and especially German plants, which could be linked to better maintenance of machinery, greater consistency of product quality, 
greater workforce flexibility and less learning time on the job. This was the early 1990s. So fast forward to today, and it seems we're still struggling in the UK with further education, and more specifically with initial vocational education, apprenticeship training, and higher technical education. In an extensive overview, which Jeff Mason published in the Journal of, uh, of Education and Work just before he passed away last year, he argued that in all areas of vocational education, the challenges are not just a matter of quantity of how many places or programs, but also of quality of the curricula on offer. Frequently heard concerns are the nation, that nationally set standards for apprenticeships and qualifications miss the regional or local context. That businesses don't interact much with experts in FE colleges to translate their skill needs into fund the foundation of new programs. And finally, that FE colleges simply lack the time, resources, or capabilities to match demand and supply for skills. Now, it's tempting to look with some envy to other countries, whether it is the Netherlands or, in this case, more importantly, Germany, as they have had better developed vocational education systems for decades. Institutional structures in which businesses and schools collaborate on a continuous basis cannot be transplanted to another place overnight. But in a fascinating study some years ago, Fort Wengel and Jackson described the actions of a group of German, Austrian, and Swiss firms operating in a metropolitan region in the south of the United States, another country not well known for institutionalized apprenticeship training. The study described that these companies joined with two American firms to form an apprenticeship network, combining theoretical instruction at the local college with practical training and application in the workplace. Their key finding is that despite the lack of a well-developed ecosystem for training, those firms were able to create such a system and ultimately bring about institutional change in this US metro area. Now, one takeaway from that example is that foreign investment can trigger changes. But more importantly, it shows that such changes can be realized by what the authors called, called institutionalized entrepreneurship and commitments of the business community. Here, businesses play a leading role and government follows the way rather than the other way around. This is a natural transition to my third and final key factor in raising productivity, which is the framework of institutions and governance for productivity. This is also perhaps the most challenging one, and it's good the Institute has begun to do a good deal of work on this. To begin, it's important to remember that there is no clear and single place in government for pro-productivity policies. There's no department of productivity and there's no silver bullet policy that will solve all problems. Many productivity, pro-productivity policies are deeply intertwined and there are lots of unintended consequences of one policy action on another. And importantly, many productivity drivers are based on business and people decisions rather than on policy decisions. Nevertheless, there is no lack of trying in shaping pro-productivity policies. It's encouraging to see that the key government departments in the UK have committed themselves to deal with the productivity slowdown. Unfortunately, the Industrial Strategy Council, which effectively connected key elements of pro-productivity policies, including innovation, regulation, and skills, was recently disbanded. But it has been replaced with new plans, including the Treasury's Plan for Growth, the Job and Skills Plan by the Department for Education, the uh, Innovation Strategy by BASE. And soon we should also be seeing the government's leveling up strategy to improve economic opportunity and livelihoods, uh, leveling, uh, uh, livelihoods across the nation, including regions that were left behind. It is hoped that the leveling up agenda will take some key notions from this lecture to heart. Give it time, read, don't become the victim of short-term gains only. Get things moving, read, focus on the issues and deal with the vested interest to unlock barriers and be aware of place. Read, devolve policy making authority to maximize local and regional alignment. This is no small task. I'm therefore glad that we have been part of starting a productivity commission in the UK, consisting of academic exports, experts to support the national debate on productivity and to make sure we have an evidence-based approach to these complex topics. The commission, which was launched just two weeks ago, will be led by Jackie Chada, today with us, director, of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. The policy issues are particularly challenging when focusing at a regional and local level. The regional productivity landscape in the UK is an extremely complex one. 
Some of the anomalies which have been well described by Phil McCann and others include the relatively low productivity level of large cities outside London, as well as disturbing differences in productivity between places across relatively small spatial areas. Recently, I embarked on some work comparing productivity and pro-productivity policies between two metropolitan areas, Manchester and Amsterdam, not completely by accident. The two metro areas are interesting to compare because of their focus on innovation. And in both cities' plans, there's ample awareness of productivity being a key driver for sustained growth and development. So they didn't need to be convinced of that. The two metro areas are, of course, not identical. Greater Manchester is about 1 million larger in population than the Amsterdam metropolitan area. And historically, Manchester was an, an, an industrial stronghold, whereas Amsterdam was more a commercial and services center. But both are now much more focused on building a knowledge intensive economy where the distinction between manufacturing and services blurs. Importantly, whereas Amsterdam outranks other cities in the Netherlands in terms of productivity, Manchester, as do Birmingham and Liverpool, perform well below London, but also below that of other smaller cities, such as Bristol, Edinburgh, or Southampton. In fact, productivity in Greater Manchester is almost a quarter below that of the Amsterdam metropolitan area. In both places, we see large differences within the metropolitan areas. Productiv productivity differences appear even larger in the Amsterdam area, but income differences are clearly larger in, within Greater Manchester, which together is suggestive of weaker mobility of people, capital, and knowledge in the Greater Manchester area. Having said that, both metro areas are facing challenges in education, and especially in Manchester in health differences. One striking observation from this uh, small case study is the vast number of organizations and institutions involved with pro-productivity policies. Especially as metro areas are made up of different municipalities, there is a plethora of organizations involved at the level of government, knowledge institutions, and business. And these multiply as more political jurisdictions get involved. One key advantage for the Greater Manchester is that there is a combined authority with one mayor so that coordination of economic policy and political accountability uh, overlap in a fairly logical way. The Amsterdam metropolitan area doesn't have this, and instead it set up a complex system of collaboration for the Amsterdam Economic Board, aiming to streamline the working relationship between the private sector, knowledge institutions, and government. Innovation, uh, innovation researchers lovingly call these coordination systems regional innovation ecosystems. But in, re in reality, you'll be at risk of being a jumble of talking shops. Now, the Dutch are very good at talking, and they keep talking if the after decisions are, have been taken. As they sometimes argue, the aim for consensus in the Netherlands is part of the Dutch genes, as it was literally required to keep the water out of a place which is six meters below sea level. But as in the case of the German apprenticeship system, it may not work everywhere. In Manchester, the Greater Manchester Local Enterprise Partnership seems pretty effective in keeping things together. It's also encouraging to see the recent birth of innovation Greater Manchester. Yes, it's another new initiative, but it clearly focuses on strengthening and joining up existing innovation and skills initiatives in the metro area. Innovation Manchester has a clear focus on key technology domains, although it includes all the usual uh, same suspects, such as health, digital, advanced materials, and net zero, which I have seen in Amsterdam and in other places too. Can we all do the same? Importantly, Innovation Manchester also includes the idea of developing an innovation deal with central government. Such an innovation deal would include funding powers to, be to get to be devolved to the region. This, of course, requires that the regions are well governed, uh, involve the key public and private actors, and have serious analytical capacity and robust decision making structures. Innovation Manchester sets an example that could be replicated elsewhere in the UK. In particular, across England, the landscape for productivity uh, policies and innovation looks quite fragmented. Some initial work by our regional productivity firms shows a frightening number of entities involved in policy coordination, as the examples for the Northwest, which includes Greater Manchester, the Midlands and East Anglia here show. Local enterprise partnerships, of which are 38 in the UK, can be of great help to bring things together, but in some cases, they may be too small for the region they're working in to fully leverage the innovation and productivity potential of that area. 
And their success also depends on the quality of local governments and effective uh, coordination mechanisms. An upcoming review of the uh, uh, local enterprise partnerships announced by the government in early September may lead to changes in governance, which currently is in the hands of the councils and combined authorities. But looking at the experiences in Amsterdam and Greater Manchester, however, it seems not very productive to me to get too immersed in messing with political control. What matters is a focus and expertise on the areas where you want to make a, a difference, a devolution of funding, and the long-term commitment instead of short-termism disruption. So let's wrap up. Where does this leave us? Where will the journey take me next as the Productivity Institute is becoming my new transport mode? In the grand scheme of things and taking a long-term perspective, I think the prospects for a modest recovery in productivity growth in the next decade are pretty good. Although it is unlikely that it will be very large or very quick. Forecasting productivity is a daunting task. So to keep it simple here um, is what it would mean to get economic growth uh, back to what it has been before. If we, if we decompose the growth of GDP or economic output in an increase in productivity, the grayish portions of this bar, of the bars, and an increase in hours worked, which are the red portions, you can see what they together contribute to the growth of the economy. Whatever the outcome, this is going to require a big change in the UK's growth model. From 2013 to 2019, employment growth, as I mentioned before, was the key driver of economic growth. And we clearly can see how the UK adopted this high labor volume, but low wage, low productivity growth path. This simply cannot last. Aging and possibly lower migration, immigration will reduce the growth in labor input in the UK to a meager 0.2% over the next decade. So if we are stuck with the same slow productivity growth as from 2013 to 2019, GDP would be no more than 0.6% per year, which is too low for all the things we want and need to do in this country. If we want to keep the productivity growth rate from 2013 to 2019, we would need to add another 1.3 percentage point growth to labor productivity. That is already quite a tall order. And if we want to go back to the happy growth days before the financial crisis, productivity growth would have to be a whopping 2.9%. It's perhaps not really what we need or is something that we will ever get to. I recently published a few pieces under the phrase, how to not miss a productivity revival again. This partly refers to the measurement issues I briefly alluded to earlier. We may be missing key parts of the productivity revival if we don't measure productivity well. It also points to the need to broaden our thinking and conceptualization on output, income, and uh, inputs for productivity. But, and that's uh, most importantly, and that brings us back to where I started, it shows most importantly that we need to start to act now, which brings us back to the three elements of the productivity journey, time, motion, and place. I'm going to end my journey in an other place than where I started, not the village with the Crispake factory across the North Sea, but an other medium-sized firm 85 miles up the road from here in the Lake District. Playdale in Haverthwaite was another family business of origin, going back to the 1700s, when Henry Crowsdale set up a timber and woodwork trade. Fast forward to 1978, when timber trade had become another industry on the decline, Jack Crowsdale was building the new community center, the new community center in Haderway, very close to the current site of Playdale's operations. As the playground next to the center was also in need of replacement, Jack and his son John got some brochures and decided to use their expertise in timber to make their own playground equipment. This swing, no pun intended, led the Crossdales to wind up their timber business in 1983 to focus solely on the building of playground equipment. By 2000, Playdale was the 10th largest player in the country, and in the following decade, it tripled its revenue as it developed an entirely new product line producing stainless steel playground equipment. But productivity remained unchanged as labor was also tripled. The company management saw that zero productivity growth was not a sustainable growth path. So in the past decade, the company went on an ambitious path to make productivity a key focus in their business model. They introduced a lean uh, manufacturing model, adopted a lot of digital design techniques, and importantly, expanded its markets from producing purely for the domestic market to a 50% export base. 
The company focused on continuous training and high employee engagement. It doubled its output while keeping employment at around the same 100 employees as in the beginning of the decade. And it managed to keep a large presence in the local community. It's another example of how time, motion and place matter to create entrepreneurship, innovation and skills to raise productivity. Barry Lee Playdales and D is on our regional productivity forum in the Northwest, and it's great to have him and many other leaders like him in these forums. These cases are not only inspiring, but they also give us a real sense of how organizations overcome barriers for productivity. With the help of our researchers, we can use these practices to understand what works best and to provide better insights on how productivity can be restored as the driver of economic development, living standards, and well being across the UK. I'm looking forward to continue that journey through Productivity Land with many of you. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. That really was um, fascinating. Uh, when, uh, when Bart sent me the title of his lecture uh, uh, this evening, um, it evoked memories of another traveler through, through another land. Um, I'm not sure if you remember when Alice, uh, when she's been traveling through Wonderland, uh, pauses and says, it would be so nice if everything made sense for a change. <laughs> well, um, after Bart's lecture, uh, things do make a bit more sense, but I'm, I'm sure you've got lots of uh, other uh, tough questions uh, to ask Bart on, uh, on productivity. Now, it is great to have uh, an in-house audience and also to have um, friends and, and colleagues joining us online. We will be able to take questions both uh, from the room and, and virtually. So please do continue to post questions and we'll pick them up um, in due course. So we have around about um, 30 minutes for, for questions. So I'd like to open up and Nancy, I, <laughs> I better give you the opportunity to ask the first one. Nancy. Thank you, thank you for a great lecture. Um, I, I just got a comment on the first thing. Um, I'm just, just before that, um, I'm delighted to see you embrace the university wearing a tie with the perfect color of purple. <laughs> um, that, that wasn't my, my comment. My comment was about the model for funding this. And I think this is a really good way that ESRC is going. I mean, universities are in competition with each other. But, but my feeling is that there's no university in the UK that can tackle big problems like productivity. And I think ESRC has really led the way in building consortia. And I, I think it's a really good way for the future that more universities should be doing. My question is about sectors and whether sectors are dead. Um, as you know, I was on the now defunct Industrial Strategy Council, although I'm pleased to see it seems to be being rebuilt on the advisory board of the Productivity Institute. And one of the studies that, that, that was done was looking at sectors and sector deals. And a conclusion was that sectors are fading and most of the new institutes, activities, businesses are cross-sectoral. Do you think productivity is going to move away from sectors now, much more generic approaches? It, it, it's a great question. And um, when I left Groningen, uh, my successors moved their productivity agenda to really measuring more, uh, do more work in the area of global value chains and global supply chains, feeling that it's not a one sector, it's how sectors are connected, uh, not just intersectoral, but also between countries uh, around the world. So when I arrived here a year ago, uh, sort of my starting point was let's not do that sector, let's continue this work on global value chains that seem to be really valuable. It turned out it's very hard to get away from it. And I think it's partly uh, because of the institutional structure that we're having. A lot of trade associations are sector oriented. Uh, a lot of sort of thinking, uh, particularly in sort of local communities and so is around the importance of sectors, you know, a particular industry that is uh, highly represented in this region. So uh, in the end, we concluded that we needed to have a bit of a mixed approach. Sectors do still matter a lot. Uh, some specific sectors, particularly in the foundational economy, um, uh, that are, are important for people to you know, be living in a place uh, yeah, like healthcare or retail and all those, have very much a sort of sector-specific approach. So I believe that the sectors are not gone, uh, but I think that we need to think more originally about involving them with global supply chain, global value chain. 
thanks, Bart. Please do raise your hand if you have a question. Um, but I, I, I maybe follow up while, while um, people are thinking up their tough questions. So perhaps the, the obvious thing which is missing from the analysis is, is COVID. So, so mm -hmm. what's the impact of COVID likely to be on productivity and the opportunity of us recovering to those pre-crash levels? Yeah, I briefly refer to a study I did last year on looking at productivity performance on a quarterly basis during the COVID period. And it's very hard because productivity was extremely volatile mm -hmm. and, and to some extent a little bit counterintuitive because productivity actually went up during, during the COVID uh, time. And that's, of course, because some sectors had to cut so much on hours and sending people on furlough mm -hmm. that at the end of the day, uh, we were still seeing a productivity increase. Uh, and also some sectors, particularly low productivity sectors, like for example, retail and hospitality and so on, particularly hospitality and the culture sector, I should mm -hmm. say, have relatively low productivity levels. So if you shut them down for a year time, the aggregate just goes up, but that's of course not good productivity. Mm -hmm. So we've done some work to actually sort out these kind of disruptive effects and see what's left in terms of within sector productivity growth. And there we actually found a few interesting things. First of all, we looked at the impact of work from home mm. and see if industries that imply, that implemented more work from home, whether that would turn out to be more productive. That actually turned out not to be the case in the aggregate numbers. I'm not saying that work from home is not changing the productivity picture, but it's too early to actually begin to say that that will be a productivity boost that we can continue uh, in the longer term. But we look more broadly at the impact of digital transformation that I talked about. And there we found a reconfirmation of what we thought, be, what we already saw before, that companies that went into the crisis with a pretty good digital model mm. were doing significantly better than companies that actually were late in this respect and had to catch up during the crisis. Mm. Mm. So I do think that actually the pandemic uh, is giving a sort of, you know, it takes things a few years forwards in terms of accelerating the pace of digital transformation. But I think it still remains to be seen whether uh, you know the pandemic is going to be a big game changer compared mm -hmm. to where we would have been otherwise. Okay, thanks, Bart. Um, we'll take a question from Gerard, and we'll take an online question for that. So Gerard, and then an online question. Thank you. Thanks, Bart. That was a terrific lecture. Um, for me, I think um, an issue of interest that you haven't really touched on is what's going on um, underneath um, the figures, inside the firms, inside the communities. So you know my background, so psychology. Um, what do you think might differentiate those long-term graphs you've got that show Britain really, we've all grown collectively, America, the Netherlands, Britain and so on, but Britain's been consistently way before digitization, way before COVID consistently bottom of the heap but growing but always below so so what's what's the role what, what what really explains that is it culture is it individual behavior what, what's going on there it is one of the key questions we will have to answer in the four years that we have left and in fact we're spending time with our team the, the today and the next few days to really get deeper into what are the right questions to ask but I just want to point again what I said during the lecture. We have to make a distinction between some level effects that keep this level systematically low and the fact that overall growth has been low. And you're exactly right that you know UK productivity has been much lower than other countries for decades uh, and in some industries for significantly longer. Um, what exactly are the causes of this? I, I think there is an element of history here that you know we got sort of stuck in sectors in which we had a productive advantage throughout most of the uh, industrial revolution and the period past it and then had struggled to actually make an adjustment to a new phase of doing this. And I think that is something that you know, takes, as long as it takes to actually get a new technology to pay off in terms of productivity, it can also take very long before all technologies are going to give way. In the 1980s and 1990s, we actually did see a major restructuring. And I did think that did give us a temporary level effect. But then after that, we again got onto this slower growth path, which partly has global reasons, as I mentioned, and partly UK reasons. Um, I think the, the huge um, uh, fragmentation that I pointed at during the lecture, I think is another key issue that makes it hard to get productivity going. And I haven't got my arms exactly around this. If you would ask me what the strength is in the UK, it might be at the same time the weakness. There is, when I arrived there, I quite often mentioned this to, to colleagues in the Institute, 
I was pleasantly surprised by how much action there is, how much initiative there is, how many ideas to have, how many brain power there is to do the right thing. You don't need to convince uh, anyone else of what needs to be done. The problem is how can we collaborate and fit together? So in a way, we're a sort of enemy of our own strength, which is a lot of good initiative, but troubles in order to really collaborate and pull it together. Take this case of the Netherlands, where they you know, keep talking and talking and talking, try to get all these people together in the room until there is some kind of consensus and everybody goes in the same direction. I'm not saying it's perfect, it takes ages before you get there, but ultimately I think there is more sort of collaboration that ultimately is leading to uh, uh, effectiveness. The other part is short-termism that's been mentioned many times. There is a tendency to say, if it doesn't work, then we'll start something else, rather than if it doesn't work, let's figure out what didn't work and let's just improve what we were doing. And that's a very different approach to issues mm -hmm. as well. So those are some of the issues that I think. Yeah, that's yeah. a good, good question, Gerard. I'm wondering whether any of these issues are also going to be picked up in the human capital side of the Productivity Institute and those more intangible aspects of, um, of, of character and innovation. And would that be part of the focus there? You know, well, I, I, so I do think that um, um, this development of, sort of innovation ecosystems that, again, the education system needs to play a critical role in this. And mm. I, I put a lot of emphasis on vocational education apprenticeships, mm. because I think that's where we can make a lot of gains mm. in a relatively short period of time. Although, as I said, it's not going to be easy to change these institutions. But there's a much bigger question around the education system, mm. of course, on you know, how do we skill and, and educate uh, mm. young people uh, and get them involved in economic activity in order to make these changes happen? Sure, and that's a big question for us as a university as, as well. But let's take a question from our online uh, community. Hi, this is a question from Kena. You discussed the importance of absorptive capacity in raising productivity, especially for laggard firms. Beyond workforce skills, what government policies could help companies improve their absorptive capacity? For example, focused on group or team skills and organizational structures. Yeah, so most of the productivity, we have to remember this, right? I mean, productivity is something the government needs to think about and needs to facilitate. But productivity is done by the private sector and by businesses. And absorptive capacity has to be created by the examples that I gave the play day example, for example, that I gave at the end, where a company itself is beginning to think about how are we going to get on this productivity path. The role of government is to facilitate it. Education and skills are very important. Uh, access to digital technology and particularly to broadband is very important. The, you know, the last mile of, you know, where you can get the coverage when you go somewhere out in rural areas, still very important. Um, um, helping um, 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 uh, people at the lower end of the income scale to have access to digital means is another important uh, aim, uh, aim to have. Uh, and generally making sure that productive companies also you know, have these sort of spillovers to the rest of the community uh, so that we don't have productive firms that are sort of sitting isolated in an area without the rest of the, the towns and the cities benefiting from it. So government is playing a supportive and facilitating role but creating absorptive capacity is something that businesses have to do themselves. And it requires entrepreneurship and innovation skills and management competencies. Okay, good. The room's uh, hotting up. And um, okay, we've got, to, let, let's take a couple of questions. We'll take Jadget and then um, uh, Steve's. Um, I've got a, a good few other colleagues wanting to get in as well. Uh, Jadget. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you, Bart. Um, so economists tell us that, that trade tends to be good for productivity, either by allowing specialization or learning or competition. Um, the UK over the period you've been describing has been a very open economy, one of the most open in the world, uh, and yet our productivity is lagged behind. So what's gone wrong? And, and you know, what exactly have, has happened or the structures that we have that means that even though we've been open, we haven't actually moved decisively towards the productivity frontier that we see around the world? Mm. Wow, that's a good question and a really difficult one. Um, and I'm not sure I can fully answer it to your satisfaction, Jackie. But I, I, I would, I would argue that if you look at the trade patterns of the UK, uh, we have not always been able to attract the most interesting foreign direct investment. In some industries we have, but in a lot of industries we don't. A lot of industries have come here to benefit from relatively low wages, for example, or just to have a market that they can sell to 
rather than beginning to build you know, an, an ecosystem in which they're operating with other supplier companies and things like that. A lot of our exports haven't necessarily benefited uh, the economy as much in terms of developing new relationships with players in other countries. So the openness of the economy, um, the openness of an economy in itself is not going to do it. I think it's the kind of relationships and the kind of um, um, the, the kind of capabilities that new that foreign investors are bringing into the country and that we are benefiting from going somewhere else that I think is something that we need to really think about more. Good. Unfair question, <laughs> I think, which is uh, what would success look like for the Productivity Institute ah. over five years? I mean, is this a, a 1% increase in GDP growth or is this, uh, uh, and when might we expect the, the, the bonus or the benefits of this uh, intervention to kick in? <laughs> Let's go for drinks, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, it's a very good question. So, so I, there, there are two things. It's something that I did think about. Um, the two things that I think we need to see after five years. First of all, I think it's critical for us to see a change in the narrative around productivity. You know, I mentioned there's one of my main questions, or two of my main questions. The first one is what is productivity and why does it matter? I put those questions forward because it's the question we get most of the time when we do a presentation outside the academic world. And frankly, even inside the academic world, I get the question. Productivity is not an easy concept. It's not a key performance indicator for business, for example. Uh, and thinking about how productivity is impacting the rest of the economy or your business or the community that you were living in, it's not necessarily clear. So we need to build a narrative around why this is important and we need to agree uh, on, on how we can are driving this. So that's the first thing I think we need to see after five years. Do we see a better narrative around productivity and do people see it make sense? The second one that I hope we will begin to see is a greater awareness that we need to get out of this low productivity, low value growth path that were in, in many UK uh, sectors. Not all UK firms are on that path, certainly not. We have a long tail, we have also leading companies, but we have too many long tails of unproductive firms compared to other countries. And we need to get out of that path. So I think if we can succeed to convince more um, sectors and more business leaders about how they can find a way to get to a high growth, high value path in the economy, that would be great. As a matter of fact, I believe that the labor shortages that we're seeing now and the potential rising wages are going to give us a little bit of a, of a, head, of a, a tailwind on that in order to begin to achieve this. So I think we're actually well set for seeing some productivity increases simply because we're being forced to raise productivity with labor shortages and higher wages. Good, I've got a follow-up um, tricky question, but mm -hmm. Becky, if you could give the mic to Kieran and then we'll go up to uh, Graham at the back on the left. But yeah, I mean, my question was, so why, um, can the Productivity Institute do this where other initiatives have, have failed? I mean, is it Nancy's point about the scale of the collaboration? What's so different about the Productivity Institute? Uh, yeah, scale matters because we can't have all the brightest minds in one place. So I think that's absolutely right. Uh, but I do think that the key element of trying to work on bringing our research program together with what are the questions in the business and the policy community and really create that sort of traffic in different directions, mm. I think is really important. So that's not easy. I mean, mm. that's really hard work mm -hmm. in order to, to, to have that connection and begin to, to, to build that narrative. Mm. And then I think thirdly, what is very important here is uh, the different disciplines that we need. I think I mentioned this at some point, mm. and in fact, it came up in an earlier discussion we had this afternoon. Economists on their own are not going to solve this. Mm -hmm. I will make an important contribution, I'm pretty convinced but we need to have a lot of other disciplines to think this through. This is management and innovation and psychology, um, mm. uh, behavioral sciences, mm. political science, which I mentioned as something being mm. very important. So I think this interdisciplinary, or at least having multiple disciplines in the, in the room is something mm. Good, exciting initiative. Uh, Kieran. Thank you. Thanks, Bart, for a really interesting lecture. I think um, my question is also about the conceptual toolbox that we bring to bear on, on, on these questions. And in a sense, it has a similar format to Nancy's question. Um, and it's in the context of the 80% services economy. Um, and we know that um, production, innovation in, in many services firms, and I know you've done a lot of research and innovation in services. And of course, that's been a strong interest here in Manchester over the last few decades. Um, we know that production in many service sectors is project-based and in project-based forms of organizing 
training, human capital development, innovation, R&D, production, diffusion, all these things merge into one thing in the context of the project. So I, so I guess my question is a bit similar to Nancy's question about sectors, you know, um, how do we deal with that conceptually? We have these very distinct concepts that are based on the way these activities are done in the context of manufacturing, in context of kind of large scale production lines where you have to do things separately. Um, uh, how do we bring our kind of, you know, analytical uh, uh, skills to bear when the, the toolbox might be slightly mal maladjusted? And I don't think the concept of intangibles really addresses this kind of complexity or this tangle. Hmm. Um, the project economy, uh, which is very visible and present in, in the services sector uh, of the economy is indeed uh, an issue in, in productivity uh, and for innovation productivity because you have these small short-term projects that easily leaks away to something else and therefore you don't have the kind of sustained growth of productivity that you see, for example, in manufacturing firms. You know, you produce crisp bakes for many, many years or, 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 or uh, playground equipment. But interestingly, you're beginning to see some conversions here because you see the, business, the, the manufacturing sector also to begin increasingly think project-based. Services becomes an increasingly integrative part of the manufacturing process in a, in a knowledge kind of intensive environment. So I think what it means is that businesses, not just sectors, but businesses are going to collaborate a lot more on these projects. That's why we see a lot more open innovation, for example, happening so that innovation more easily flows from one firm to another and that it doesn't get lost and another firm starts to reinventing the wheel again. So um, intangibles is probably not the right answer to this, but the, the right answer to this is to make sure that we create an environment in which businesses can innovate openly and share their, whether you call it intangibles or innovations much more easily amongst themselves. Okay, let's have Graham's question and then we'll take another one from online. Thank you very much. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, Lecture. My question is actually about projects again. Um, what's the role of infrastructure in the economic development through your, your four industrial revolutions? Because that could explain the difference from the moving from the mushrooms to the yeast in the sense that rocket is useless without a railway network to run along. My mobile phone is useless without the Wi Fi and broadband networks to allow it to communicate. Yet we see very little discussion of the role of infrastructure which takes a long time to develop and Thomas Hughes did a very famous book on networks of power so that could explain why you've got this lag because you have to build an infrastructure networks allow all these innovations in sense start interacting economically so your thoughts yeah so so the role of infrastructure in particular what we call hard infrastructure as you mentioned rails and roads and all these kind of things is one of those hotly debated issues in productivity. And there's a big issue around causality here. And, and there's sort of what is driving which. When I heard the conference board, I, um, uh, I spent a lot of time in China uh, for lots of presentations where infrastructure was, the way there was build a road somewhere and great things will happen. So I, I sometimes made this remark there and said, okay, we build a road to the middle of nowhere. And, and then why are we doing it? And then somebody raised their hand and said, well, you come back after two years and you'll see you know, one of the most productive economies. And they were quite often right. And I think that is right in a context of an emerging economy like China, for example. I think in advanced economies, in the ones that we are currently in, this is a much more tricky issue about what is the causality? Is infrastructure going to lead to productivity or is productivity going to lead to the right demand for the kind of infrastructure that we're actually needing? So the other thing is that obviously hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure get increasingly integrated with each other. So you talk about digital, but you know, part of the soft infrastructure is also, you know, good healthcare and a good education system and all those kinds of things. So we need to think also in terms of hard infrastructure in combination with these other types of things. Okay, so we have an, on, an online question and then we'll take your question. Uh, <clears throat> this is a question from Jonathan Haskell. How do you see the transformation to a low carbon green economy as affecting productivity? I was waiting for that question um, <laughs> because I was very well aware that the word green didn't appear a lot in this talk. And uh, I was aware of that. And that's not because I didn't want to talk about it. It's just that, you know, there's an end to how much I can bore you with more discussion. Um, it's, it's an absolutely critical topic for productivity researchers because I am not sure and I think nobody's really sure 
what the move towards net zero is going to do for productivity, because we've got a couple of issues to think about. So first of all, we have to think about mitigation, right? I mean, climate change is happening and we see, you know, all the damage that is going to, that's being done in various countries around the world, including in the UK. And, you know, mitigation needs to happen in order to prevent further productivity losses as they're happening. So what does that exactly mean? Is that a productivity improvement or is it just preventing a loss? So that's, I think, one key question, the whole mitigation agenda I'm not so clear. We won't see it in terms of a rising productivity growth rate. It might just be a counterfactual in terms of avoiding a further productivity declines. The next thing is the transition that we're making. So the transition from a fossil fuel economy to a non-fossil economy, that's not going to be an easy kind of transition. If you talk about the general purpose technology, and this is a combination of general purpose technologies putting together, and it's going to be uh, taking us a very long time to do this with a lot of productivity losses down the road. And I don't immediately see at this point that the transition itself will very quickly lead to more productivity growth. And then at the end of the day, once we have a non-fossil economy, we'll want to think, what is that going to look like? So what is the circular economy that we'd like to see at the end of the day going to be? Is that going to be a, you know, a job-rich, low productivity, low value, but green economy? Or is it a highly productive, high value green economy where in people, you know, in which people can innovate and skill. And again, I think it's unclear what that path exactly is going to be. So I think it is very important that we think now about what is the innovation path that we're choosing in getting to CO2. It's also why I mentioned, you know, the outcome is clear. We want to get to a net zero kind of environment, but what are the resources to get there? And what and how are we going to allocate these resources to make sure that they're ending up in the most productive places, not in the least, so that we can perhaps get there faster or that we can actually reach more societies and more communities with this kind of net zero strategy. So it's, it's a great question. It's not an easy answer, but it is a, you know, one of our key themes uh, in the Productivity Institute to study over the next few years. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Chris Giles from the Financial Times here. Um, but when you, when you talk to ministers about the particularly the very poor performance of UK productivity, uh, in the past decade, they say something along the lines of, well, it's not so bad because it's, it, we've had, look at our employment performance, it's been fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it's much, much better to have people in work uh, doing something than out of work. And therefore you had a bit of a higher productivity performance. Uh, is, is that view entirely worthless? Or is there something to say that maybe you do want to get people into work first and then productivity will flow later, or productivity growth yeah. will flow later. So part of this, of course, is a judgment call, right? I mean, do we want to have people in work who can hardly make a living? Or do we actually then prefer to have these people out work and give them some time to skill themselves and things like that before we actually put them back to work? To some extent, that's a judgment call, and it's kind of hard to see what the best way is. I do believe that actually getting people in work is a good thing but not if it makes it possible for businesses to continue on the low productivity, low growth path. And I think that's what's happening. That's what happened a lot with basically higher low skilled and low wage people, because that's the way we can continue our all business model, right? If we, if we hire people at low incomes, we should invest in their training and we should invest in their skills so that we can raise their wages and we can make them more productive. That apparently hasn't happened in the UK automatically. And that's why I'm saying that, you know, maybe we're in a good spot right now and we see some labor shortages and wage pressure and maybe we'll finally we'll have to do it because you just won't otherwise get new workers. So, so I think that might actually be a, a, a benefit or a blessing in disguise if you put it like that, that we will get. So some value to that, to that point. Uh, but to me, having people with low incomes in work can only work for me if that leads to an investment to get them to a sort of livable wage and making them more productive for organizations society. Can we just push that point just a little bit further? So one of the things that really um, impressed me for the discussions when you were um, when you were formulating the plan for the institute was its sense of purpose, not not just the intellectual agenda, but you wanted something good to come out of this. So is there a relationship between the question that we've just been asked and the leveling up agenda? Or how do the two things connect together? Well, um, 
let me not try to define the leveling up agenda. I think a lot of people who actually are trying to do that in the coming weeks. But as I mentioned, I'll just underline what I said during my talk. I, I think there are some, some real critical parts to the leveling up agenda that will make a difference to make it sustainable, right? And that is, you know, the fact of don't go for the short-term gains only. We'll probably need some short-term gains, otherwise you can't politically sell it, but not at the cost of getting the long-term achievement. That I think is going to be absolutely critical. Uh, we need to really be uh, aware of uh, of context and place and mm. have to realize that some of that means devolution of powers and particular of funding to the to uh, the location and the region where this is going to happen. I think these things are really important in order to be able to get a leveling up agenda that's not just going to lead to more transfers, but actually to a self-sustained path of faster productivity growth. So I think that's what we can contribute is to make sure that we don't get in this kind of, you know, more transfers mm -hmm. to make things look good. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it is not going to make any difference to the vitality of a place mm -hmm. to, to be able to survive in the longer term. Let me have time to squeeze in one last online question. Okay. million to 35 million pound turnover market we are finding our biggest challenge is getting these businesses to be proactive in looking at their business before a crisis happens rather than after mm. assuming they survive these businesses make up a huge chunk of the uk economy so what actions do you think we can take to encourage a more proactive approach from these smes incentives yeah so you know repairing the the roof when the sun shines rather than when it starts raining is is absolutely critical and we've seen it being paid off during this pandemic as i mentioned earlier those companies that did invest in digital technology and made all these changes before the pandemic were much better in dealing with it during the pandemic than the ones that had to very quickly catch up um are there incentives um it, it it's always hard to get a long-term focus but we've seen companies to actually begin to think about it and i think some of the incentives are again to be in an environment where you can only hire people if they find that working for your company is going to be interesting, uh, that it is worth investing their time into more training, that they are engaged as an employee in that company. And then, you know, all these good things of trying to, how can we make this company better and more able to, you know, to sustain some of the, the pressures of the future is going to, is to going to work. So I think the incentives are very much coming from inside. And, and are very much dealing with the, the, the roles that entrepreneurs are going to play in making the, that, that company an attractive place to work. Okay, well, I think it's almost time for a crisp bake and a glass of wine. Now. And, <laughs> and, some play, and some play equipment. And so, yeah, so before we head off, we'll hand back to um, our uh, head, of, uh, head of school who uh, close things off. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much. Mark, for a, a really insightful thought of some uh, lecture today. I was thinking as, for example, the head of Alliance Manchester Business School about the issue of managerial competencies. And for example, within the business school, we are now seeing an explosion around employers wanting to use the, the apprenticeship levy. But one of the challenges is, of course, is there's a, a lot of criticism of the apprenticeship levy because it isn't delivering at the, at the lower end. But then it makes you nervous if there's this explosion of interest at the top end, is the policy going to be sustained or reformed in some ways um, going forward? And then what does a business school do in continuing to invest in something that seems to be very popular, but there's a lot of noise outside that, that is very critical of it. And what seems to be a shame in terms of the debate about the apprenticeship levy is how we can't be thinking about improving competencies at all levels, but that's not how the debate is being conducted. And that's what makes for an incredible nervousness about investing um, in these areas. So it's just making me think about all of those issues. So just to say, thank you again, Mark, for, for your insights today and this incredible lecture and for Ken for facilitating the discussion so well. Uh, to everybody who enjoyed the, joined us in the audience today face to face and also for those online this is the first time we've managed questions across both both platforms so to speak 